He was born ignobly in an aging hospital in a decaying neighborhood. His father had gotten back on his battleship eight months earlier, and his mother's labor was hard. He came nine days late. The doctor was worried about his temperature from the beginning, about a degree and a half above normal, so they monitored him closely. It would be unreasonable to imagine that the fire that raced through the hospital the night he was born had anything to do with the infant John Russell. After a handful of oxygen tanks exploded and the automatic extinguishers malfunctioned, it was a miracle Moore didn't die, like John's mother did, from the heat and smoke inhalation, trapped in their rooms by curtains of raging flame. In your mind, if you make yourself more than just a man, if you devote yourself to a night, and if they even stop you, then you become something else entirely. Hello there, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Miltra, and I will be your gaming monk for the evening. If you've followed this channel for a length of time, you'll know that I'm a bit of a fan of Fantasy Flight games. Part of it's due to them being a Minnesota-based company, and I will always support my local boys, but they have a reputation for high production values, for better and for worse. As well as cards that don't bend. Suck on that, Wizards of the Coast. Well, they're in a real good place right now with Genesis, Archon, and the Star Wars RPG trilogy. It's easy to forget that they were seen for the longest time as a board game company that only dabbled into RPGs to write a trend. Yes, they were one of the many companies to take advantage of the OGL bubble, but there were a few in-house systems they handled. Today, we'll be looking at one such entry, Fireborn, an urban fantasy sending around reincarnated dragons while trying to have the most cinematic set of mechanics it can muster. Does it pull it off, or is it simply a World of Darkness wannabe? Let's find out. I should note that I do love the gimmick with the two handbooks. It's a neat way to give the appearance of a dragon on the covers. That said, the books manage to have just enough detail without overdoing it. There's an odd gimmick where the first 16 pages of the player's handbook are in color on glossy paper, but the rest of the book is in standard grayscale. They'd have been better served by going full color or full grayscale in my opinion. I'm partial to the former, honestly. But the only real issue I have is that I prefer an index for the sidebar as well as the normal affairs, and the player's handbook is a little conservative for setting details. Overall, it's solid, but with some small niggling issues that keep it from being perfect. Fireborn's dual-era storytelling takes place in a contemporary London where magic has begun to return to the world. No, this isn't the sixth world, there's no cyberware for you here. On the other end of the equation, it also takes place in a more fantastic past called the Mythic Age. Player characters are human reincarnations of ancient dragons, called Scions. This means that we'll be making two characters. So we'll do that first with the human Scion as Malcolm, and then later his dragon self, Malrix. The first step is buying Aspects. Aspects are the core attributes that represent how one might approach a situation, the four aspects being fire, water, air, and earth. These can be thought of as physical and mental pairs, but the aspects aren't exactly set. We'll get into that later. Anyway, Scions get 28 points to spend on the four aspects. Since Malcolm is a fairly balanced Scion, he'll be going with four in each of them. Second is Background, the life before the Scion learned of their true nature. Backgrounds can be thought of as an archetype that determines starting skills and advantages. Looking through the list, we'll go with X Military. This grants us four ranks in its primary skills, two in its secondary, in this case quickness, one rank in the following edges, arsenal, fluid fighter, and weapon specialists, three fighting style ranks, and a wealth rating of two. Third is your sire, the dragon you take after, even if you are not directly related to. A sire grants additional edges, fighting style ranks, and karma to the scion. We'll be going with Ryu in this case. This grants the Action Junkie, Karmic Release, and Strong Edges at rank 1, four more Fighting Style ranks, and one bonus Karma. Fourth concerns derived stats. This mainly concerns health and karma. Karma can be thought of as equal parts magic points and extra effort, and starts at five times the base Earth value plus any bonuses from your Sire. Thus, in this case, we have 21 Karma. And health is based on water and earth, multiples determining the wounds thresholds, and earth determines the number of minor wounds that can be suffered. Both cases are four, and calculating accordingly. Fifth is bonus points. A starting scion gains one free edge and a number of physical and mental skill ranks, in our case, eight apiece. The extra edge we'll use on Action Junkie, bringing its rank to two. For physical skills, we'll put two each in athletics, stamina, and travel, and two more in quickness. As for mental skills, We'll go the four in Senses, two in Interaction, one in Will, and one in Ka. Ka is a bit of a complicated thing to explain. In short term, it's your magical skill. Sixth, Fighting Styles. 
a set of actions that grant certain benefits. We have a total of 7 ranks to purchase fighting styles, which in this case will go for Luring Blade, Rank and File, and Eastern Small Style. Finally, Equipment. You can start with one item for each wealth rank a character has. Since Malcolm has a wealth rank of 2, he gains a rank 1 and rank 2 item. So we'll be going with a broadsword, a longsword, and a colt python. Dragon creation is the other half of the character, the scion's ancestral form. In a way, the goal for the scion. To that end, we'll be going through steps for the ancient dragon Malrix. While there's a simpler form of creation called mirrored, we'll be using the advanced version instead. The first step is Aspects, which works the same as it did for Scions, but instead of 28 points, you have 40 points to spend. Additionally, you have 15 points to spend on a 1 to 1 basis for your Superhuman Aspects. The only limitation for these is that they can't be greater than their relative aspect. Taking all that into account, Marlick's Aspects are 5 at each, and his Superhuman Aspect is 4 in Fire, Air, and Water, and a 3 in Earth. Second is Outlook which mirrors the Scion's background, but with a few twists. First, it grants 6 ranks in primary skills and 3 ranks in secondary skills. Then, it grants the fighting style and spell picks temporarily, reflecting the dragon's long life and varying tactics over that life. Finally, dragons have a horde instead of wealth. And looking through the available options, we'll go with the Guardian. Third is Breed, which determines your physical appearance. This is split between dominant and minor breeds, choosing one of each. Going somewhat traditional, Alrex's dominant breed is Drake and Ice Dragon. Granted, an Ice Dragon is a little less traditional, but I think it all evens out. This grants the following benefits. A 9 damage claw, a 12 damage bite, minus 4 penalty to actions requiring fine manipulation, a moderate movement gait, fast flight, armor 10, flight 2, scout senses, a gripping skull, a razor tail that inflicts 12 damage, and the camouflage and wall crawler traits. Additionally, he gains 5 powers that can be assigned at ranks 1 through 5. These will be Alternate Form 1, Skin of Stone 2, Instinct 3, Air of the Storm 4, and Cold Spawn 5. Since he has 8 picks for fighting styles, we'll go with Swift and Ravager. His 4 spell picks will be spent on Sidestep and Coruscating Bolt. Fourth is the Dragon's Legacy, a powerful karmic ability that is their pinnacle, akin to a dragon's breath in typical stories. Of the ones he qualifies for, Quickland Body seems to be the best fit. Fifth is Bonus Points, which works in a similar version to how they worked for Scions. The only difference is that you have five edges, one of each rank from one to five. For bonus skills, we'll spend two on ranged, two on travel, three in athletics, three in quickness, four in casting, three in interaction, two in medicine, two in stealth, and two in rituals. As for the edges, we'll go with Deft 1, Karmic Release 2, Resilient 3, Casting 4, and Aspect Advancement Fire 5. While it might be tricky to work with the idea of two characters, Scion and Dragon creation is pretty to the point with little in the way of min-maxing. The only real problem I have is that the character sheet is woefully inadequate. It's a nice design, but it doesn't contain everything I'd like it to, and it really struggles with the mix of edges, powers, legacies, and spells for dragons. I get the idea of not wanting a huge character sheet, but I think this could have been handled better. Fireborn uses a d6-based pool, called Dynamic D6. It's a smart move of them to delve into this early in the book, because how it works is significantly different from its contemporaries. Before we delve into the trickier bits, let's tackle the baseline. When you need to roll dice, you roll a number of d6s equal to one of the four elemental aspects. Die that end up as a four or higher count of successes. The four elements can be categorized as physical and mental actions in fire and air, and their reactions governed by water and earth. Where things get interesting is how it handles actions and reactions. In most cases, this would be handled by an attribute plus skill formula. Here, a skill determines how many die you can move. For instance, when making a fire athletics test, Malcolm could merely roll his four fire die, or he could roll up to six die, taking two die from his water pool. It should be noted that powerful scions and dragons have supernatural aspects, which grant automatic successes to their given aspects. This ties into the combat system, as the key is a series of dynamic combinations rather than singular actions. Every participant has a set of actions that they can access. Think of it akin to making combo moves in a fighting game. The pool of actions are based on your aspects, but regardless you may use one physical and one mental sequence. You aren't as limited regarding reactions, but each one after the first of its type adds a one die penalty. Each successful action then moves them further along their sequence. Fighting styles add to this by granting a set of payoffs to certain successful sequences. The concept here is to create near choreographed sequences between combatants, 
especially since the majority of attacks are opposed tests. Fireborn's equivalent to extra effort is karma, described as the spiritual essence of the world. Spending one point of karma on a test grants one automatic success. Where this gets interesting is on opposed tests, resulting in a karma bid. During one of these tests, both sides secretly choose a number of karma to spend on their action and reveal it simultaneously. The second use of karma is magic, which is both powerful and dangerous for the caster. Magic is governed by a two-step of actions in weave magic and casting. The former is an air test, while the latter is fire. Both use the casting skill to move dice if so desired. The first action is necessary to determine if you can cast the spell, while the second determines how well you cast the actual spell. In both cases, you still need to meet the spell's threshold, and this is where the dangerous part comes in. If you roll too few successes on the casting, then you run the risk of adversely affecting the karma rating of the area weakening it, or at worst, infusing it with taint, the antithesis of karma. Strangely, the rules for taint are in the GM section instead of the player's handbook. Now if you roll too many successes on the casting, then you suffer a magical recoil that inflicts 10 damage per extra success. Fortunately, you can mitigate this with the spell's casting options if they're available. These allow you to buy off extra effects to lessen the aforementioned damage. I'd say the mechanics here definitely tie into the dynamism it aims for but its wide pool of actions might be difficult to track. I'd recommend using printable cards that were included in the Lost Lore PDF if you can still find them. Now I don't normally cover advancement mechanics in these reviews because there's usually not so much reason to. However, Fireborn's advancement system ties into the character duality, so I'd be remiss if I didn't mention it. Experience is gained through advancement points that are usually split by the GM into two forms, Humanity and Heritage. The former are rooted in actions during the modern age, and the latter concerns ones tied to the mythic age. Edges can only be purchased with humanity, and powers can only be purchased with heritage. Fighting styles and spells can be purchased with either. It should be noted as well that when you have ranks and power tied to the dragon's relevant legacy, you may use that legacy. Acquiring powers is done with the assumption that you'll be treating the dragon form as your eventual goal. You can diverge from this, but the catches that buying ranks and powers your dragon form doesn't have are slightly more expensive, namely that they're treated as one rank higher. This all ties into Awakening, the centerpiece in a kind of ranking trinity between Humanity, Heritage, and Horde. The first two is increased by every 10 points spent, while Horde is based on the highest rank Horde item that you have. Your Awakening rank is equal to the lowest value of the three, and each rank in Awakening grants two benefits. First, you gain a rank in a supernatural aspect, capped at the same rank as your dragon form. Second is the ability to manifest draconic traits. Your awakened rank equals the number of points you can spend to buy traits your dragon form has, which can be called upon with an air will test or a stamina fire test. Alternatively, it can be activated by spending karma. I really like the advancement system here. Aside from the fact that they didn't go with the whole experience as currency thing that a lot of games like this do, it represents a journey with the implication that the dragon form is the destination. However, this does add to the clutter problem I mentioned before with the character sheet. Even so, I'll always respect when a game uses mechanics that reinforce its narrative. While Fireborn has been compared to World of Darkness, a comparison I find suspect, I'd actually make comparisons with Exalted. In some ways, it does things better, namely the attempt to depict over-the-top combat with reincarnated heroes. By basing everything on the four aspects, it allows itself to be a very intuitive system, but one with potential issues in execution. See, Fireborn doesn't care for the notion of having systems in the background, each part flowing into each other. Instead, it wants the game to be run as if the GM is a director of a series of set-piece scenes, and the mechanics are meant to be an integral part for the active scenes where the economy of actions is as important as success or failure. This might be an issue for some, especially since this could be argued as being too gamist. I don't agree, but I could certainly see the argument. Regardless, approaching the game is going to demand a bit of adjusting to how it wants to do things. Rethinking the approach, as it were. Fortunately, everything is fairly intuitive and straightforward. Power overload could certainly be an issue in later play, but that's more of a sheet problem than a gameplay one. I don't have anything concrete, but I have to wonder if the editing was somewhat rushed during development, given the extensive amount of errata and web expansions during its run. Even with all of that, 
I'd give this game a stamp of strongly recommended. Its combat system is one of the best cinematic styled ones I've ever seen, and it belongs right up there with Feng Shui and similar titans of that detailed combat subgenre. I would advise getting both the player's and the GM's guide for a bundle if it's available. Fireborn is a flawed gem, possibly even a diamond into the rough, but it is a gem nonetheless and possibly one of Fantasy Flight's more underrated RPGs. While it's a bit of a long shot, I wouldn't mind seeing a second edition, possibly one that takes in some aspects of Genesis. It wouldn't be the first time that you tried to mix two completely different setups, but that's just one of my little pipe dreams.